All right, and this is the second time, and this is Gavin McGuire, event trader, uh, being joined, of course, by Brett Manning for our first sentiment and flow show in a couple of weeks. We, of course, had the uh, trade, trader strategy meeting last week, which really uh, provided our thoughts at the time. So now we're going to do a little bit more of an in-depth look at the sentiment and flow data that uh, we use to try to predict which way the market's going. So without any further ado, Brett, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Gavin. How about you? Pretty good. Pretty good. I uh, tried taking a short a little bit earlier. I was kind of laughing because I saw you had similar ideas, but uh, you weren't thrilled with the market action. And uh, I ended up throwing in the towel on mine for a small loss here. I know Scott's playing the cues right now for a short. So uh, we're just uh, keeping an eye on this action, but definitely some choppy action. Just using the S&P as, um, as our stay here, right around that 3,100 level. Just a lot of straddling on that today. So do you have any uh, further thoughts on what you're seeing in the markets today? It's just really narrow, choppy action. And I think that um, because we have seen such a volatile tape and one that so consistently delivered people you know, big moves to be either wrong or right on uh, lately and with a VIX as high as it is in a stable sense, um, you know, you're going to get that when, when you're in that kind of context and you have a narrow choppy tape, it's about the most dangerous thing you can come across. People start to lever up more because they, they see the pattern spots for reasonable stop zones, especially in index plays and they get narrower with the market. And I commented on this uh, a few minutes ago, as you start to get a tighter range in a market that's been really volatile and there's been a lot of active speculative trading going on in index plays, you tend to get higher leverage that gradually builds up throughout the day and the stops are sitting out there. So a lot of the moves you get become more likely head fakes simply because it's a function of those stops and it's a function of the leverage. It just, they just kind of cascade each other out in both directions. It's not really a trick. It's just going to happen when you have lots of people speculating on a tight pattern in a volatile market. So it really leads to a dangerous situation um, when you get sucked into that because you can get kind of, kind of pushed into a rhythm of trading too much and too big and too tight. And you just, you know, you just get churned up. So I feel like that's the kind of tape we're seeing today, and I'd rather see it get away from that before I start to participate. Yeah, it's interesting because when we were doing the uh, trader strategy meeting, I think we were all pretty much in the same camp that, um, you know, we weren't in love with anything at that point. There definitely seemed to be a little bit of exhaustion there, and uh, we were waiting around for a pullback and uh, a little bit more interesting openings in some of these names and one of the things that we'll take a look at today that we were trying to figure out um back in the trade strategy meeting was who exactly was in the market what was the makeup of that and uh we've come across a lot of interesting data points um that i think are going to help us try to figure that out uh some conflicting data for sure so I'll, I'll be curious to bounce some ideas off of you and to uh, take a look at some of the action that we're seeing in the markets. But I wanted to start off, Brett, with the sentiment data that we've been seeing because it's certainly been intriguing. We, of course, had the pretty big beat on the New York Empire number earlier in the week on, uh, on Monday. We had the Philly Fed earlier today with a pretty handy beat. And so just to clarify, you're talking about economic sentiment data. E well, economic sentiment data, and uh, we're also going to get into the AAII survey. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so on the, f from the economic uh, standpoint, uh, the soft data, we had the Empire number on Monday, uh, or just earlier today, we had the Philly Fed. On Tuesday, we had a better than expected NAHB housing market uh, number, and we also had better than expected zoo survey data out of Europe. So we're definitely seeing some of the soft economic data coming in a little bit better. But um, the AAII data really kind of turned our heads a little bit earlier today. And I know you follow that closely. So uh, you want to run down some of the things that you were seeing in that data? Yeah, sure. I mean, so it, it's, it joins a long list of things that are kind of giving us, you know, widely contradictory data points. So I'll, I'll probably use that phrase several times today. That's, 
the the core theme here is that there's really remarkable extremes on one end and really remarkable extremes telling you the exact opposite situation which really kind of takes some some you know high level analysis to sort through and kind of try to figure out where the where the real message is and i think that the real message and i'll, I'll circle back around to the aaii but i think the real message that I would say contextualizes this this situation really sort of 30,000 foot is there's just an extremely contentious analytic picture. I mean, the, you you can you could reasonably say you expect a deflationary depression that lasts the next two years. And just as easily, you can say you expect an inflationary boom that takes the S&P to 5000 over that same period. And I think both of those views right now can be argued by rational and reasonable people with about equal amounts of supporting data. Well, it would certainly explain that tight consolidating pattern we've seen over the past few days, right? Well, yeah, I, but I don't think I, I don't think that I've ever I don't think that anybody's ever seen a situation where it's it's you can have very reasonable people, not not kind of uh, hyperbolic analysts who are looking for some dreadful outlook or looking for some you know huge bubble to come. And, and, and can marshal you know, about equal amounts of supporting data to make those views clear. I don't think we've ever seen a situation where the spectrum of, let's say, reasonable data-supported outlooks, where the poles of that spectrum are so far apart. And I think that in a, in a context like that, you're going to get some difficult-to-analyze sentiment data. You're going to get you know, extremes there, too. Um, and part of it's just this consistent high amount of volatility, something where you've got a lot of, let's say, weak-handed, non-professional money speculating doesn't necessarily mean the market has to go down a lot. A lot of that speculation, and we looked at this in an internal meeting a few days ago, a lot of that speculation is in inverse ETFs. So you know, it's not necessarily a directional indicator that there is retail money speculating on the volatility that exists right now. Um, that just means that you know, maybe the market pattern you're seeing is not necessarily all that indicative. But we're going to talk about a lot of different data points. And one of the basic frameworks to approach this market is through the surveys. And in the uh, American Association of Individual Investors survey, it's a small sample, but it's consistent. And it's a large data set with a long history. Um, and, and, and the question basically says, you know, they ask the same kind of group of hundreds of people. Uh, do you think the market is going to go up six, over the next six months or down over the next six months or basically stay the same? And that leads to the categories of bullish, bearish, and neutral. And right now, as of this morning, we just saw the bull ratio, which is the number of bulls divided by the number of bulls plus bears, so the people with an opinion, um, how many, what, what percentage of them are bulls. That is down to about 33%, which is a, a kind of – History will show in that chart that that's in the zone that usually means that you have a contrarian buying opportunity. That's usually associated with bottoms in the market. So that's where we are right now. But at the same time, and we'll probably get into this too with the options data, you're seeing a uh, uh, call buying that's through the roof, especially by smaller accounts, which is usually something you see at big market tops. So we've got a lot of different data points that show us this kind of situation where there's there's trustworthy indicators showing – opposite signals. And AAII right now would fall into the category of saying maybe active non-professional money is overall bearish on the market and to a level where, generally speaking, it suggests a lack of exposure. So if the news cycle turns better, if we start to get more positive data, there's money there that you could say can come into the market and start speculating on the upside that's not already there. Yeah, I, I find one of the interesting things, Brett, is uh, I, I believe you uh, mentioned uh, Jeremy Grantham in your morning comment today. D did I see that? I, I, I oh, yeah. Um, and when I because I was I was reading that um, piece from him as well. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is because you talk about the AII data with uh, that bold number coming in at 24.3 percent. Um, which is the lowest that we've seen since uh, the May 14th one. And he was talking about the valuation in the stock market and how, um, how high it is 
But then he was also talking about um, the weakness in the economic data points that we've seen. Sure. So I, I do find it interesting that you're getting the exact inverses then on the surveys, because that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that economic data survey point with the Empire and the Philly Fed. Now, they are coming against um, pretty low-hanging fruit there in terms of a recovery. But it was interesting to see the investment data, survey data coming in well I don't want to say well below expectations because we didn't necessarily have expectations, but seen a pretty big drop off as the markets go higher. And then the economic sentiment data coming in higher as we've seen the uh, data, you, you know, come, come in and see a recovery. But I don't think to the extent that we've seen on this soft sentiment. Well, data. Let, let me just so let me just interject. I think that in, in the economic sentiment surveys, one thing you might see it as is that as of, let's say, a month ago. A lot of people who are in, you know, in the thick of supply chains and trying to try to understand how to apply resources and whether or not they're going to expand, you know, are they going to open a new plan? Are they going to order more inventory or whatever? They basically said to themselves, all right, we're heading into a recession that could last a long time and we don't know. And this could be really bad over many months to come. And that's where they were a month ago. And suddenly now. You know, and, and remember, a month ago is when we saw crude oil trade to negative forty dollars a barrel, and suddenly now maybe it's not quite as bad as we thought. And the difference between those two ideas is starting to, you know, be willing to ramp back up in terms of in terms of capital expenditure, in terms of orders, in terms of inventory stocking, and everything else. Um, so I think that that's you know a, a sort of relativity from the sort of pit of blackness of March and April to the idea that maybe this isn't quite as bad as we were thinking it was. Um, and I don't know that, it, you know, it, what investors have seen is the market price that in well ahead of schedule. And it looks like it's at odds with the current economic data, not counting the sentiment data, but the actual hard data. And the disparity there is making it awfully tough to be bullish looking out to the next six months after such a run. Right. And I mean, you know, just watch that play out definitely feels like we're at a point where uh you know the economic data will continue to be followed i thought the claims numbers this morning were interesting and i'm, I'm curious to see how the markets react because when we were talking about that trader uh in the trader strategy meeting what the biggest risks were to the markets mine was a, a somewhat a flatlining of economic data after that low-hanging bounce back fruit was was grabbed and we start seeing things kind of peter out similar to what we saw in china how does the market react to that how does it digest that data in terms of okay maybe this economic bounce back isn't coming as fast as the market's right. showing sort and of after the snapback whatever exactly yeah ex exactly like you're not going to yeah, get that's very reasonable you're not going to get retail sales data up 17 percent month over month for the next three months in a row you know it, it, it's it's going to be a little depends bit on more how much money we print and send out <laughs> very true we could do it if we need to get it there we could do it very true and uh that's one Another of the five trillion bucks that, mm, we that, can get there. that's one of the topics that we'll have to get into as well i'm just looking at interesting parallels to the late 60s with social unrest there but um you know with that aaii uh survey number brett um you know one of the things that i did see was uh you know the biggest bull bear split so it was minus 23.4 percent meaning that bears were uh 23 percentage points higher than the bulls last time we had seen a number that high was uh back in the middle of may and just kind of keeping an eye out on the action on what we did uh around the middle of may we broke higher you know that came in may well, 14th so and... let me just let me just suggest that you you just read through so if we see a survey like that with a population of respondents like that where there is the widest disparity you can imagine between the bears much more of them and the bulls much fewer of them you know how how exposed to the stock market on a speculative basis do you think these people really are in their portfolios and the idea is that they're not so if the environment improves from here you know this would suggest that they would then go back to a more normal level of exposure so there's that sitting there it's just like what we'll talk about when we get into you know where money market funds are and and maybe a little bit of a debate over the the concept of cash on the sidelines but you cash levels in portfolios cash in money market funds and say active non-professional investors all kind of 
a consensus view that the market has to go down from here over the next six months. You, you, you'd imagine that what that implies is that that cross section of market participants is not in at all heavily exposed to stocks right now. Right. And I think one of the things that we'll look at that's pretty interesting is the flow data doesn't necessarily reflect the um, survey answers in this. So, uh, you know, just one of the things we, we've talked a lot in the past about um, the Barron survey and how you feel that uh, it's a lot of the managers talking their books. It's a marketing piece. It's a marketing piece. To me. Do you think the AI, AAII survey could be used to kind of try to rattle money out of the markets for uh, more favorable entries? Who's the villain in this story? Uh, well, I mean, obviously the survey respondents, so I don't think you have... They would, they would be collaborating? Uh, no, not, co not collaborating. I, okay. I, it's just something that I'm throwing out to you in terms of... It's a tricky game theory landscape it, you're, it, you're constructing here. It is, it is, but as I mean... As far as, yeah. It, it, They'd have to have a chat room and plan it out and have a meeting and... Right, but I mean, I don't see it as but, likely. But but you see, so you see them collaborating on the Barron's survey, but not on this one. I think that if you're an institutional money manager managing a large, long-only equity-only fund, then there's a personal contribution to that. I, I think that if you are an individual, non-professional investor, I mean, we're, these these are these are small fish. They're not managing client portfolios. They're not trying to get clients. They're not trying to keep assets in the house. You know, this is your third bedroom E-Trade investor, um, and I, you know, it's just they happen to be a member. They pay membership dues to the American Association of Individual Investors, which provides educational resources and some market data and a newsletter, you know, but they're managing their own household finances, including their, you know, the, the, the way that their retirement capital is is invested. Um, whereas the fund managers responding to the Barron survey are some of the largest long only equity only fund managers in the world who I think have unquestionably an interest in making sure that the investing public at large maintains faith that it's better for them to not touch it again. You know, every downturn, it's the same thing. Don't touch your, your long-term investments. The market always comes back. Just think about something else. I know the VIX is at 60 or whatever, but just it's going to be fine. Like I think that there's a marketing process there to speak to the world using a major publication like Barron's to, to, to keep – keep assets in the fold. And I don't see the same incentivization structure for people responding to the AAII survey, I guess. Even if they missed out on the rally? But I don't think they think that they're going to, they, they would need to be, they would need to be, uh, uh, they would need to be more organized than I think they possibly could be. I, I guess I can't say for sure. It yeah. seems unlikely to me, though. I okay. think no, no, that, that's fair. And I'm not trying to, I'm just playing devil's advocate if, if we're looking at one survey. Um, do, does that need to be taken into consideration? Uh, not, and you, you I don't know, think it's being gamed, I guess, uh, okay. bottom up. No, that, that's fair. That's fair. Um, and, and that's important to denote the uh, difference between the two. Now, there is a question, true. I guess, about the Bank of America fund manager survey. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the popularity is the issue there. The question is, has it become popular enough for it to be seen by the respondents as a marketing vehicle? Because nobody knew about it a year ago. Right. And it's become more and more popular. And it's possible that the data that we get from the fund manager survey, which is I don't think that there's now one could make the case that, that, that some of that data may come directly from an anonymous survey of Bank of America prime broker accounts as far as cash levels and things like that. So there may be that, you know, when you when you if you agree to be a part of this, you get advanced data on it and you agree to let them kind of anonymously survey because this is, I think that it's a survey of people who are fund managers working through Bank of America as a prime broker. So it may be that there's a, a, a quantitative kind of barrier there that makes it so that it can't be become something that where the data is easily falsified. Okay. All right. Uh, last thing I'm, with the AAII here, Brett, that I'll throw at you. Um, the eight-week bullish average slid to 29 Point one one percent. It's been on a steady decline, uh, really, since um, we could go back to uh, March fifth. Uh, this was the lowest eight month or eight week moving average that I saw since uh, you have to go all the way back to the middle of September. Um, you look at the bull ratio. The uh, the uh, no. The, this is the bullish eight week moving average. 
Just the bullish percentage, okay. Yes. So uh, the lowest since um, I had, uh, what was it? you have to go back to October 10th, actually, of 2019. If you recall our conversations back then, we were talking a lot about how there was just pent up activity in the markets. There was still money on the sidelines. And, you know, the sentiment data was just far too low. And that's when we ended up getting that late rally into the end of the year. Do you see something like that building up here, or are there too many uh, more other variables such as the election and the second wave for you to feel as comfortable this time around? I'll tell you what. It doesn't seem extreme enough for me to use it as a as a setup. It did right. in the same indicator, basically, a five-week moving average, but the same indicator basically in early 2016 where we got the average down to 21, and it stayed there for weeks and we're talking about a five-week average, which is you're, you, you're, you're dealing with months there of people staying at this extremely bearish level in the market about any chance of the market going higher. And you had a narrative there in terms of the commodity side of the market blowing up, and we're heading into Brexit, and we're heading into the election, and all of these things were all kind of stacking up. At that point, to me, that was unquestionably a setup, and I used it to position my own money just based on – well, there were confirming indicators as well, but but a number of different indicators that showed a kind of festering of deeply embedded bearishness without the market being able to break lower. And that's an extraordinarily bullish type of situation. I don't think that we've constructed the same thing at all in this case. But if you're going to use the AAI data as any kind of cue, it's certainly a nod in the direction of thinking that that all of this talk that the market is definitely in a bubble right now and has to collapse tomorrow – it's not consistent. However, over a very long time frame, there are times when bearishness in this indicator ends up preceding a collapse in the market. It's not unheard of. Um, it, you know, these guys were bearish in in mid 2008. So, you know, if if we're headed toward a disaster and things have turned worse, it's not unheard of for the AAII respondents to turn bearish ahead of the major downswing in the market. It's just most of the time in the grand sweep of history, this is a contrarian indicator, especially when it sits at one extreme or the other for a period of weeks. All right. Um, so let's keep on with the sentiment uh, data here, Brett. We're going to move over to um, the sentiment trader uh, data from uh, Jason Gepperth's site, of course. Uh, first, I'll, I'll put out... Uh, some of the areas where we're seeing excessive pessimism and then some of the uh, areas where we're seeing excessive optimism. I would say this, Brett, um, kind of building off of your comment where you can make an argument in either direction. This is one of the first times since we've been doing the sentiment and flow show that I really felt like it was pretty even keel with the number of um, data points that we follow that was in the excessive pessimism camp and then in the excessive optimism camp and some some of them didn't make a lot of sense in terms of the uh, difference but in terms of excessive pessimism uh, we had the inverse ETFs which you had uh, mentioned before uh, the bear market probability the small trader put buying which I'll ask you about in a second here and hedge fund exposure now the hedge fund exposure will uh, we're going to go back to a data point that I caught in the um, fund manager survey that kind of goes against this. And, yeah. and, and I would say one of, one of the things that I noticed was conflicting data because we're going to be throwing at you guys today um, Barclays, some Barclays notes, some Goldman notes, as well as the Bank of America. But with those data points that I just mentioned, uh, was there anyone in particular that was sticking out to you? No, I mean, I just think that, yeah, just as you painted it, there's there's a lot of data points that are showing opposite end extremes. I think one of the ones you mentioned, the small trader put buying, you know, by the same token, small trader call buying is in the opposite extreme. So it's just there's I think one of the things that's making it difficult right now is unquestionably a massive spike in participation in the options market in general. And I would say that that goes back to our sort of opening statements, that this is a highly contentious analytic situation, and there's lotto tickets being bought in both directions like crazy. When you see volatility where it's at, the pricing of options obviously is not becoming a barrier. People are willing to put a little bit of money 
into a big bet on a leveraged instrument in both directions in this market. So, Brett, so I'm seeing a lot of data that kind of yeah, because the small trader put by that you mentioned. I, I I ask you this, and I know that there's no way of really breaking it down. How much do you think that is of people that have been buying stocks that feel like they don't want to sell their stock here, the give them a run up, and they're hedging? Exactly. What, what, I mean, is there any way of breaking that down? I, I suppose there's not. There, it's tough, but I would say that the fact that the the robo ratio correlates the other direction suggests that, um, and that's to you know buy to open. I mean, you can't be you you can't know for sure. Um, my guess, my gut feeling is when you're talking about smaller traders, you're usually talking about something that's just a, a, a leveraged speculative asset rather than part of a more complex investment strategy. Um, look at if you've got a small account, then if you want to make big money in the market, you're going to need a leveraged instrument. And one of the ways to do that with a very limited account, look at the volatility that's going on, look at the craziness that's happening. A lot of people out there have small accounts and want to get rich in the market. The only way that they're going to be able to do that is using options rather than shares. So I think that we've seen a spike in options participation as we've seen an increased number of non-professional market participants come into the action. And I think that makes perfect sense because the options market is the way that you are able to leverage up that smaller amount of money to make a large amount if you think you're going to be right on some big idea that you have in the stock market. So I think that, but we're seeing it in both directions. Again, we're seeing puts, we're seeing calls. Yeah. We're not necessarily seeing something like the late 1990s where yeah. everything was on the long side. It's just, you know, there's a lot of people coming off the sidelines to speculate in the stock market. And let me tell you what, they weren't shorting. Right. Um, and then the inverse ETFs, uh, you, do you see that as more of a retailer play to kind of highlight? Absolutely. It's yeah. another one. It's how do you short the market when you don't really understand, let's say, futures trading? And maybe for people who really don't understand the options market, but they, they, you know, they're they positive that the apocalypse is coming tomorrow and the market's going to crash. And so, therefore, that inverse NASDAQ ETF is going to go through the roof. Yeah. Um, so, and then uh, taking a quick look at the excessive optimism, Brett, as you said, robo, um, and that was a big swing too. So, uh, again, does that just kind of uh, look to you like the um, the retail? Say it again. Which one? It was a big swing, the robo um, ratio. Uh, yeah. Before Huge. it was nearly an excessive uh, pessimism territory, like just two, three weeks ago, and that swung in. Do you just view that as the retail crowd kind of being a little fickle with this current rally? And, you know, once they got the jump up, now they're trying to just play the other side for a pullback? Well, no, that dove because of call buying. The, it dove because of call buying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look at the it's it's a it's a it's a put call ratio. So the lower it goes, the more calls. Put call calls the denominator. Okay. So um, yeah, when it dives all the way to zero point four, I mean that is that is a that is the best um, that is the best indicator for making me want to participate on the short side in this market. Probably of everything that we're going to look at right now, that is probably the number one indicator that's pushing me, that's urging me, that's saying, hey, you got to short, you got to short this. This is going to fall apart. Like that's the one that leads in that direction. But I like to see a big picture where there's a number of different data points that aggregate into a kind of, you know, a, a consensus weight of evidence that's very directional, a lot of extremes all in the same direction. And this market is not letting me do that. There's other data points that are pushing me in the exact opposite direction. So, um, but the robo ratio right now taken in and of itself is unquestionably a bearish input from a sentiment standpoint. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, same with mutual cash fund levels. We could get into that, but we... now there's a three month lag with that data point. So right, but uh, in the last three months, a whole lot's happened. Yeah, we'll, we'll also get into that with the uh, Bank of America yeah. fund manager survey, and then again the high low. Uh, ratio we've talked a lot about this in the past but definitely top heavy um when you look at the fund manager survey i think that the uh u.s tech um 76 percent of the respondents or something felt that that was the most crowded trade out there and that's reflective here in that high low so uh that that's i think why you'll see 
Um, you know, Scott, go after the Qs. I know you go after the NQs a lot when you're looking to short these days. Uh, speaking of the NQs, we are getting a little bit of a breakdown here late day. Brett, is uh, that just dips about 20 points here coming in. The um, session lows there uh, go, going back to 8.05 this morning was right around 99.30. So we're about 13 points away from that. Any thoughts on this little dip here in the NASDAQ uh, futures prep? Yeah, so, I mean, we're sitting in this, what I would call a, a, a lateral consolidation that's been going on for three days now, um, and it's a whipsaw range, and it's in the context of a bounce, and it, if we if we had flushed out to the upside first um, and maybe taken out the three-day range highs and then spiked back down, I'd be more willing to look for a short position here, but, you know, it just, it kind of precludes me from doing that, given that we're just kind of swinging around inside of this range, um, you know, I, I need more from the pattern to, to, to get me interested. Okay. Um, then one of the things in the notes that I sent you, Brett, that uh, piqued my interest from the Sentiment and Flow show, they were talking about institutions um, had been piling into money markets um, and much of uh, retail investors, as much as the retail investors have been, uh, they uh, they noted that over the past year, asset growth in money markets hit nearly a 40-year high and has now only started to reverse, uh, basically saying the cash on the sidelines argument is weak and futures returns didn't support this bullish argument. Uh, they also noted that hedge fund exposure to stocks showed conflicting signals uh, with perhaps a slight downside edge. Uh, did you have any thoughts on any of that with um, the institutional uh, money piling in? So, I mean, I'll, I'll just say that um, when you have an enormous amount of money flood into money market funds and into cash held by large portfolio managers, it is almost a perfect contrarian indicator. So I'm not really sure I buy the argument, even though you can, you can make an argument that the whole notion of cash on the sidelines is a, is a kind of, you know, it's a kind of intellectual dead end. Um, but the reality is the weak hands get out of the market and those positions are taken up by, let's say, distressed asset or value buyers or or insurance companies or pension funds or whatever, some big balance sheet down below. And when you're in that state, when a lot of the, the let's say, people who wish they were in stocks during a bull market are all sitting in in cash and then the market context starts to improve that unquestionably to me is a a, a, a sort of bull side factor in uh, analyzing things and i think that data goes back i mean when, when you see uh cash levels in, in 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 portfolios abnormally high and then you see the environment improve the context improve generally speaking that's a really strong period for the market um, because inevitably that cash is going to start to be deployed and fine. Somebody else has taken those positions when they were sold, but they've taken it much more lower price levels and they're much stronger hands for the market to be sitting in. So when you transition from weak hands to strong hands, it's supportive of the market. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand that it's not a silver bullet. You can't just say there's a lot of money in money market funds and therefore the market has to go higher. That's certainly not the case. There was a lot of money in money market funds before Lehman went under. So, yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's reason that there's a lot of money in money market funds. Yeah, and and uh, just to kind of uh, add to that point, I guess Refinitiv Lipper um, in their latest survey showed that uh, assets in the money market funds had swelled to about 4.6 trillion, which was the highest on record dating back to 1992. So yeah, um, how much of this do you think is the liquidity that the Fed's pumping in? How much of which? Um, the money sitting in money market funds? Yeah. I, I don't. I mean, I, th I think that it's the reasonableness of predicting an economic depression. Right. OK. So now w with that in mind, are you surprised that we haven't rallied higher given some of these numbers that we're seeing in money market funds and the equities? No, not really. I mean, I, I don't know how to I don't know how to answer that question, I guess. Okay. Um, I, 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 I don't see it as I, I think that it's supportive on pullbacks, particularly if those pullbacks are due to maybe headlines immediately hitting that don't necessarily have a long-term impact. 
All right. And then I'm um, just going to throw out a couple of Barclays notes on some of the positioning, too, before we get into the fund manager's survey. Brett, get your thoughts on that. Uh, Barclays noted equity fund flows. It's seen positive flows in the last four weeks. This is a note from uh, from Monday, uh, including increased risk taken by retail investors. Right. We've uh, seen evidence of that. They noted that flow in a VIX ETPs have become significantly positive as a sign of bullish retail sentiment as it indicates retail investors are not in cash and have active risk risk exposure i think is an interesting point but isn't it the statement that they're finding ways to bet against the market too so yeah yeah, risky ways risky ways but um still betting against but uh still money flowing in and right. then they noted that institutional positioning has become less bearish with net open interest and in e-mini futures rising $50 billion from their lows two weeks ago, uh, mainly driven by asset managers increasing equity exposure. So it, it does seem like we're getting a little bit more of, of a uh, professional flow into some of this recent data, right? Which, from my perspective, Brett, that means I have a little bit more confidence in key support levels, such as a 200-day moving average holding holding court if tested. Yeah, but I mean, you know, let's let's all remember that this is all about the virus, really. Yeah. And and I, I think that the bridge has been short enough at this point that people are willing to get on board with the idea that. Let's say things improve dramatically in terms of the virus. Let's just say hypothetically, and I know this isn't the case, but let's say hypothetically a vaccine were available tomorrow and it was already manufactured for everybody in the world and you were to receive a package the next day and you just tap yourself on the forehead and you're vaccinated. Um, Presumably, at the point that we're at now, we'd have a massive amount of stimulus that's not going to be taken away and probably – you know, people in the restaurant industry would be immediately rehired um, and the whole situation would kind of – there would be some uh, a friction in terms of reassuming the economy that we departed several months ago. Um, but we – it hasn't been long enough, I think at this point, to cause enormous friction that leads itself – to a deteriorating picture, even in the absence of the virus catalyst. So this is still everything we see is still some assumption about the future course of the duration of the virus as a catalyst in the economy. And people just don't know. So a lot of this information is really something that could flip on its head in 24 hours, depending on the evolution of that narrative. And I think that it's really important, whether you're looking at flows data, how much cash somebody has, what the economic projections are, all of it is extremely volatile and can completely change over 24 hours based on our evolution of our understanding of the duration of that catalyst. And I think that's evident in the next two bullet points that I'm going to read off, Brett, because we talked about some of the money that's coming in. However, Barclays also noted short positioning of leveraged funds remained extremely bearish at four-year lows, and therefore the risk of a short squeeze is high in, in their view. Sure. But, um, but they also noted option markets also show uh, re- remain uh, bearish as the put open interest and call open interest ratio and yep. skew continue to remain high, indicating continued hedging demand. Kind of Which going, again, going yeah, back but, to that also, call buy that we we're talking about. Yeah, but I mean the options data, I, I'm not really sure how to parse through that sentence. But the options data unquestionably, like I said with the robo, is, is the one data point where you look at and you're like, well, this is some kind of speculative bubble. I mean, there, there's elements there. Even though there's, there's high put buying, you look at the 10-day S&P, you look at the, the, the robo ratio, you look at the small traders, you look at the option speculation index. And I think that this is really, again, I think it goes back to, to um, the, the, a, a lot of new market participants with small accounts being involved in the market and not really paying for shares. Right, and I think it's a simple way to look at like a lot of ticket bets in the market, and 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 it, it unquestionably is you know disconcerting if you are bullish and you're holding a full portfolio of exposure to stocks to see that kind of thing skew toward call buying, but it's not necessarily damning. Yeah, um, and it'll be something we continue to play out. I don't know if you just. Uh... There's a story that came across the wire earlier, Brett, about a uh, trader who had just committed suicide. 
because he woke up with a negative seven hundred thousand dollar balance in his account. Um, it's a bad day. Wow. Jeez. I, I'm assuming Wait, he probably. I did not see the story he, at all. He probably had a naked short on somewhere. I'll I'll shoot it off to you. But, That's um, 1929 it, kind of narrative. Exactly. But, I mean, this is why if you are out there and you are a sub, unless you're Guys. savvy, do not naked short any options. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's and, and, and again, let's, let's go back to the metaphor. When you're using leveraged instruments of any kind, it is picking up a chainsaw. You're putting down a handsaw and you're picking up a chainsaw. And anybody who's ever used a chainsaw – if you make one little slip up, you're going to cut your leg off. Yeah. So futures, options, anything you're doing with them, it may seem like they can make you rich. But if you're newer to this game and you've decided to go ahead and get into leveraged derivatives, you will either listen to what I'm saying right now and do a really amazing job of providing yourself with incredible insight and wisdom just from words or somewhere in your future lies a very bad day yeah. because eventually – you're going to listen to that little devil on your shoulder and who just says you can, you have enough money in your account to triple or quadruple this position size. Let's go ahead and do it because you're definitely going to be right and it's going to work out. And then tomorrow, you know, there's a new car or whatever else. Um, and, and that's going to hurt you terribly unless you respect it the way you respect a chainsaw. Yeah. When you pick up a chainsaw and use it, you know it's so obvious. It's so viscerally clear that you can take off a finger or a toe or a leg or an arm if you just haphazardly use it. You don't drink a six pack of beers and go outside and just start whipping around a chainsaw. So same thing goes for derivative instruments. If you're using a handsaw, there's not nearly as much risk, but as soon as you move to that chainsaw, you can destroy your life overnight. Yeah. You get long puts, get long calls, um, do whatever you need to on that. But, uh, even then you should be aware of what you're, uh, what you're getting into, what your risk is, but understand if you're short in these instruments, you have unlimited risk. So just unlimited, don't do it. Um, okay, Brett, let's take a quick peek at the uh, Bank of America flow show uh, data. I'm um, just going to kind of touch upon this because I think the more interesting pieces are in the fund manager survey. There was one bullet point that I'll pull out from this and I get into the inflation argument on things, Brett. But um, it's, as we've been talking about, a lot of flows going into the markets and the flow show kind of provided some more insight into this where they saw $24.6 billion flowing into bonds, $13.8 billion flowing into equities. That was the largest in nine weeks and uh, $6.9 billion out of cash. Um, what was interesting on that bond flow stuff, Brett, and I, I guess this is uh, in the can't fight the Fed, let's flow where they're going. The um, Munis saw the largest inflow ever at uh, $2.4 billion. Uh, the second largest inflow was to investment grade, and of course, that was $18.6 billion. That comes, uh, I, I think, again, some front-running on that Fed corporate buying. Yeah, I was going to bring in the Fed, well, and the Munis too. Yeah, right? I mean the muties have become Fed balance sheet. Bottom. Yeah, exactly. And so that, you're you're seeing money move into wherever they know there's a backstop, and you've got a skewed bet where you're basically betting with the house at this point. Right. And what was interesting was the fifth largest government bond outflow ever at 4.8 billion. Because there's better place to go. This is now a guaranteed thing. Government bonds were the only guaranteed money because they yeah. by a printing press. But guess what? Now muni bonds are, and so are corporate bonds. Why sit? in in government bonds there's you're you're still going with a risk-free asset right um now uh some of the things uh that we also saw was largest inflow to banks since november of 2016 which is really interesting um when you consider all the concerns around the low interest rates and how po uh poorly banks have performed but it puts the xlf and fas on my screen um you know we did see the Fed kind of move away from negative interest rates. Powell has hit on it the last two days in his testimonies, and he's kicked back against that. And uh, there was some kickback too, Brett. I don't know if you saw earlier in the week against the yield curve control um, with uh, Daly and uh, I'm going blank on who the second um, second Fed uh, governor Bostick, was. Bostic, maybe. No, it wasn't Bostic. It wasn't Williams either. Uh, I'll, I'll double check back around there, but. Uh, but it definitely looks like they are against yield curve control as well. And we have seen a steepening yeah. of the curve 
there with some of the improvement around the economy. So I do think financials look a little interesting. You got any thoughts on financials here? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the money flowing in is an economic bet, obviously, just because the Fed says, you know, rates are going to stay at zero for until 2022. Obviously, that's contingent upon the economic outcome. And if the market is pricing that sort of thing in as of a month ago, you know, suddenly we're seeing it leak out into the idea that it's just possible that this isn't going to be a deflationary pothole for two years. Right. And one other thing to keep in mind with the uh, banks, we got their CCAR results coming out. And it's going to be really interesting, Brett, because I know a lot of the times for the CCAR and the DFAST results, um, you know, you look at the worst case scenarios and they're kind of laughable at the time until you see until you see pandemic this. Yeah. And, and you're like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe they were uh, viable. Well, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, though. As I understand it, they're able to withstand much more than anything like we were seeing let's say 12 years ago. Yes. Yeah. They're much better capitalized than 12 years yeah. ago. But, um, you know, we, we start warming up. We're what about three, four weeks away now from uh, Q2 earnings. And uh, the focus is really going to be what they do with the reserve builds and that, you know, people are going to really take that as some insight. Cause uh, you know, the Q1 uh, definitely had some pretty big reserve builds. I think JP Morgan was like 8 billion city group, like mm-hmm. 6.5. Um, so that's going to be one of the key things that people are going to want to be taking a look at. Um, moving forward but uh the ccar results should help set the table for that and uh financials i just think are going to be one of the more interesting plays and i was interested to see all this flow data going into it um yeah also the largest inflow to europe since february 2018 and i've been pressing europe a lot the last couple of weeks as an area where i saw money flowing into uh after the eu kind of struck that fiscal um deal now brett me and you both yeah. know that you still got to get 27 um different countries on board for that there is a eu uh meeting over the weekend they have downplayed the idea that they could come out of that with the deal but obviously people will be watching headlines to see what you know what of- it is though you know what we've seen i think part of it is like okay are they going to come up with a formal declaration of the united states of europe no no But what we've seen is where everybody leans when things get the scariest. You know, like that's what this was a test of. And I think that it became clear at times that the northern European countries, when things were really looking their scariest and most bleak toward, let's say, second half of March, first half of April, that that's when there was momentum toward some kind of um, some kind of fiscal safety net across the entire eurozone, and and I think that that's the important piece of information because it's almost like that means there is a fiscal union, e- even if we don't have it formally established right now. It tells us when the chips are down, what which direction of the fence things are going to fall on, and I think that's hugely important. The safety net is is kind of there informally just by seeing the instincts of, you know, everybody involved and and the fact that there was an appreciation for how Germany's fate could be much worse if Spain and Italy defaulted on their debt. Right, and and like you said, they are they do appear to be, but uh, still in the early innings, and it's just crazy that one country could offset that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a story that uh, will be one of the more important ones and certainly been a key reason why we've seen the euro uh, rally as of late. So um, so with that, Brett, let's take a look at the fund manager survey. Um, and I, 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 I think uh, we've talked a lot about kind of the Jekyll and Hyde type of um, performance going on in the markets. And I think that was pretty evident in their opening statement. And I'll just uh, read it so um, you get a fair idea of where this fund manager survey was going. But it said uh, the uh, fund manager survey shows growth expectations jumping, cash levels collapsing, risk appetite surging, Wall Street past peak pessimism, but June optimism is fragile, neurotic, and nowhere near dangerously bullish. And uh, one one of the things that I found the most interesting with this, Brett, was uh, this was the largest number of fund managers survey investors since 1998 that think the stock market is overvalued. So 
it, it's tough to figure out the sentiment on this being overvalued, yet we're seeing money coming running in to buy. <laughs> and yeah. I, I guess it just kind of speaks. It says it all. Yeah, it, it just really sums it up and says it all. Uh, with how confusing this market is here. What do you think of that statement? And was there anything that like was making you laugh, scratching your head, or what have you? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, it goes back to just what I said a few moments ago about the virus determining everything and you know where we go from here. Um, and the fact that the bridge so far hasn't been too long to find ourselves back in a good situation if, it, if the duration problem isn't extensive and the fact that the people who are being surveyed by this are not virologists they don't have any advanced information they don't know anything more than you and i do about the course of that really um so you know they're in a situation where they've got to say well the, the economic data is what it is so unless i'm willing to say that that's that's you know unreal data because it's just a consequence of uh, virus fighting policies that don't necessarily have a long term impact, and I don't know how to judge that thesis, then just relative to that data, of course the market is overvalued. So, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of caveats that come with all of these data points. And again, you know, it's going to come down to things that have something to do with something other than uh, uh, invest, in, investment allocation or financial market analysis. All right. Uh, just keeping an so eye grain out. of salt. Yes. Um, just keeping an eye out. Uh, some hearts news about them uh, finding lender financing uh, uh, while they're uh, in the restructuring phase. So we'll keep an eye out on those shares. But, uh, Brett, taking a look at Exhibit 1 from that uh, survey, we see the expectations for a V-shaped uh, recovery did rise from 10% to 18%, with, of course, the UNW-shaped dropping down from 64 to 75 uh, but it is interesting that 53% of investors think that this is a bear market rally. Now, that is down from 68%, but uh, again, it speaks volumes to the confusion in the markets there, as uh, this would be one hell of a bear market rally. The only say? way to rationalize a meaning for that is if that is the statement that 53% of them believe that we are relatively imminently going to be heading all the way back through the March lows. To right. me. I don't see another way to have meaning out of that statement. Yeah, and that, that's how I take it too, because um, you, you know, if it drops down at twenty eight hundred and then bounces back, that uh, yeah, how's that a bear market? Yeah, how's yeah. that a bear market exactly? I mean, twenty uh, percent from this level here, you know, that would get us back to the twenty four. Surely everybody agrees that bear market is downward movement in market prices. Right. So uh, again, just another uh, kind of confusing uh, point and again speaks to the uncertainty in the markets here uh, biggest tail risk still remains the COVID-19 Brett uh, that's sitting at 49% uh, just looking for the exhibit there for you um, let's see moving forward I promise to have this one that's uh, exhibit 30 Brett down on page 12 um, so biggest tail risk remains COVID-19, uh, that's 49%. Permanently high unemployment stood at 15%. This was actually down, though, from the uh, May survey. And uh, the one thing that was popping up, well, two things that were popping up were the third and four uh, issues. That's the outcome of the U.S. presidential election, which we've Big seen week. the rise in the, um, in the blue wave. And then making a fresh appearance was trade wars. At nine percent, yeah. So, uh, so things to keep in mind, but still probably underappreciated, I would think. Um, you know, but it does highlight again, all eyes are on the um, are on the uh, what should we call it, the COVID numbers here. I would agree that the trade war theme is underappreciated simply because it can be mobilized as a as a a, a resonating consolidating factor for Trump's base. Yeah, just making that a part of the news cycle on a regular basis and taking the news cycle off of other issues, just, you know, consolidating and confirming the whole tough on China situation, especially after, you know, revelations from Bolton's book. He may need to feel like he's got to reconfirm his China hawk credentials to his base. And that right there 
is probably enough of a reason to believe that we could see a lot of, let's say, uh, tweets and headlines that have to do with tougher on China kind of theme. Right. Um, so mo- moving along here, expectations for GDP and EPS are higher. Probably not surprising given some of the early bounce back numbers we've seen in linearity uh uh, numbers we've seen as well, Brett. Uh, investors raised their global growth expectations by 23 percentage points to 61 percent. Now, one of the things that I do see that's interesting is global PMI uh, does not rise above 50 until October in these sentiment surveys, which uh, is interesting because I, I feel like October and November um, set up for interesting months given the idea that this is the election season and also uh, flu season kicks back up. How, how, how do you uh, see the, the idea that global PMI uh, is able to recover right into the teeth of those two uncertainties? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it seems like an aggregate data point. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's not one person thinking that. It's the aggregation of lots of different views that average out at that. Um, cause yeah, once you start to look at it that way, it seems like that's exactly when we've got, you know, likely to see people start to de-risk. All right. Um, keeping an eye on some of these, uh, one of the things that also jumped out to me, Brett exhibit 32 net 16% of FMS investors say they are not currently taking higher than normal risk levels, which is up 18%. So that was a little bit higher risk taking going on. That's no longer the case. Do you find that um, difficult to add up when you see some of the options activity going in? Um, Well, I mean, you're dealing with, um, as we were talking about, you know, really different kind of target audiences there. Um, So that's 16%. So they're not currently taking higher than normal risk levels. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't I, – again, you're talking to fund managers versus talking maybe to a lot of retail investors who are trying out the options market for the first time. Right. Okay. Keeping an eye out on these – some of the other numbers. Um, what I don't understand about that data point is, is that saying that 84% are saying they're taking – No, it's net the 16. Risk? That, that's a, it's net 16. So my read on that, that, that – they are not. My read on that is 58% are saying that they are not compared to 42% and thus not 16%. That's how I read that data point. So 58% are taking higher than normal risk levels. Right. As opposed to the prior month where 40%. But I mean, that's, or, or is it the are, opposite? They, are, they not. are not. They are not. Okay. Yeah. We're right. opposed to last month, sir. We're as opposed to last month, sir. Yeah. The net ones, um, that's how I always read it. I'm using 50 as the uh, baseline and whatever the net is based off of that. Right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, so so the majority are not taking higher than – which, of course, right. fits with everything else. Right. Um, and there's another data point to just kind of center into the whole narrative here. Like, the, the, you know, pair that up with small options trader activity. Yeah. Which you were just making that point exactly, and I'm just rounding around to exactly what you were talking about, not realizing it initially. But, yeah, right. That, I mean, that's an interesting – that's an interesting demonstration of the sort of polarized – data set that we're dealing with right now right and i, th- I think what that adds up to to me brett is that we could see quicker shakeouts but support levels hold it's which how, is exactly is, how I read that. is exactly what i said in in our strategy meeting yeah right exactly so got little um, air pockets that will hit a wall of buying so the data supports that theory that uh, you yeah, postulate so um Let's see some other items. Uh, fear of a prolonged recession is down to a net 46% in June. This compared to 93% of April. So you could see a lot of cooling off around the worries about a prolonged recession with the bounce back of some of that data. But again, they don't know. But they don't know. They're, like yeah. historic level of they don't know. I'm just right. going to re- I'm going to keep reiterating that point over and over again because we're dealing with lots of data points that typically would mean a lot more than they do right now. Because yeah. this is contingent upon epidemiology. Yeah, exactly. Um, all fantastic points. Um, and then uh, what? Uh, one of the things that I want to harken back to, too, um, net 65% expect yield curves to steepen in the next 12 months. Again, right. this, this harkens back to... From a um, flat curve. From yeah. a flat curve. But how do banks make money? Steepening yield curves. 
And sure. again, the, the flow into the banks, this type of commentary on expectations for yield curves, I think it bodes well for the banks moving forward. Again, they've got some big data points coming out here, but just something Especially to off keep the dive we got off of Powell, right? I mean, yeah. Powell said, hey, the interest rates are zero forever. Yep. And that, you know, took the floor out from underneath them. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, Powell isn't actually – I tried to post this right after. Like Powell isn't actually projecting that. He doesn't know what's going to happen – with the virus any more than anybody else does. But he's just making sure that you understand that the Fed's not planning on increasing interest rates unless the economic environment changes. Exactly. Um, and then, Brett, uh, just to kind of wrap up a few points here, uh, June cash levels were down to 4.7% from 5.7%. Again, talking about that money coming off the sidelines. This was yeah. the biggest not drop. The yeah, biggest drop since August of 2009, and any time yeah, – It's throwing in the towel the GFC. on the sitting out idea. Right, exactly. And then uh, the last point from them on this, before we get into that inflation, we'll do that quickly. Um, institutional funds, which are pension funds and insurance, have been buying, and retails, which uh, they view as mutual funds, unit trusts, and investment trusts, have cash to deploy – and then the last point. Well, wait, um, wait, 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 wait. So stop there just real quick. So, so sure. this is something we talked about a lot in 2016 too. This yeah. is that same trade. This is this is uh, uh, dividend yields are higher than interest rates. Right. If you are somebody who would prefer to be just buying fixed income securities to meet your obligations, because what they're calling institutional investors, they've got future obligations to pay out. Insurance companies, pensions, funds, etc. They need to make a certain amount of money every year to be able to meet their future obligations in terms of payouts. And you know, when you when interest rates collapse to zero across the curve, they have to move out of fixed income securities. And when the when you're looking at the dividend yield of the S and P, the market crashes, that that thing goes through the roof. And the comparison between that and the ten year Treasury bond is going to pull that type of money into the market. And that's exactly the kind of support we saw. And that's exactly the kind of support we saw three years ago, four years ago. So it, it, there's this continued safety net that, that needs to be taken into account if you're just looking to you know, short, this, short the market into crashes when we hit these kind of interest rate levels. Exactly. And um, you know, all important points. And then the last thing on that, Brett, hedge fund net equity exposure rises to 52% from 34%. This was right. the highest since September 2018, which – um, diverge from the short earlier. Covering. It, it's short covering. You think that's a lot of short covering because I think that they, you've got a group of hedge funds that were bullish and a group of hedge funds that were bearish and the bearish ones have started to give up. And so the net is shifting dramatically. Okay. Well, then that would line up with what we were seeing earlier with um, uh, the, um, hedge, the hedge fund exposure from um, Sentiment Trader. Be, and the Barclays note. Be, yeah. yeah, and the Barclays note. So, so yeah, so that would make sense if it's the short only. Uh, well, I mean, they're ahead. throwing in the towel. The, the people who were sure that, you know, they could just you could just load up on short bets into, the, like, the S&P testing the 200-day. You know, we just grinded through that and then squeezed. You can see it on the charts. We accelerated once we got above that level. Exactly. Um, and then the last point we're going to touch upon this week, Brett, is inflation. And there was a few items that were really jumping out to me. Um, starting with this one, net 13% belief fiscal stimulus is too strong. Exhibit number? Uh, I, let me see if I can find that exhibit number. I apologize. Uh, I'll have that better prepared for you next time. Um, so we'll just say it. I, I'll find it. Just go ahead and let's we yeah, can talk so, about it. So net t net yeah, so I just wanted to use that as the opening salvo in this. And then I was going to run down a couple of things. I think I got it. Exhibit yeah. 28 on inflation expectations? Yeah. So okay. net 13% net believe fiscal stimulus is too strong. The last time um, this was in May of 2019, or this high was in May of 2019. Um, now, uh, was it 35% uh, expect global GDP to get a lot stronger, which was the highest in 25 years and the largest jump since August 2012 in CPI expectations. FMS inflation expectations rose 31% to a net 21%, meaning uh, 21, a net 21% expect higher global CPI in the next 
12 months again the largest one month jump in august of 2012 since, and that, yeah, since, right and then the last thing that i wanted um to add in here let me just see i gotta just find it here um, we obviously have to jump back in uh, commodity prices going on in oil right now. We want to see if that's sustainable. But um, there was one part in the flow show that really jumped out to me. And that was solving wealth inequality requires inflation and redistribution of a stagnant economic pie. And we've certainly been hearing a lot about that with the income inequality. The late 1960s analog of social and civil unrest led to bigger government in a smaller world, uh, noting the end of uh, Bretton Woods, rising bond yields, a falling U.S. dollar, volatile sideways stock markets. And, uh, you know, this all leads to a potential hedge against inflation in 2020. So, again, in the late 60s, the last time we were trying to solve inequality problems, there was a push in the um, to really uh, boost economic stimulus, and that caused Brent Woods and the end of the gold standard and really the monetary policy as we know it. Brent, I know you've been hammering the gold long. I've been hammering the gold long. Um, how do you take this data all into consideration as a potential inflation trade going over the next one to two years? Well, so the biggest thing for me would be, let's say we get a result of the, 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 the conundrum specifically about um, the virus. Let's say we get a result that's optimistic. Let's say we get a, a good case scenario, this sort of looming positive unknown unknowns that I've been putting in my notes where you know we can't really predict, but it pops up on the radar because you've got you know a million PhD geniuses all collaborating in dark webs constantly with billions of dollars of resources trying to work on solutions. Solutions pop up. You couldn't see him coming. That's going to keep happening. Let's say that adds up to an unforeseeably good outcome from this situation. Do you think we're going to see the stimulus taken back quickly? I do not. Um, and I also see a transition that we've made, and I talked about this in the strategy meeting, where fiscal stimulus has taken the baton from monetary stimulus all around the world. There's more fiscal stimulus happening than there is monetary stimulus. And this is – as far as I know, the first time it's happened since maybe the World War II period uh, where you really see that. So this is a different kind of historical analog situation. But uh, the, the problem for me there is not only does it not get taken back quickly because the monetary authorities are concerned about um, um, injuring the recently, wound, the recently healed animal, um, but also that's in the hands of politicians in an election year. And I don't see a lot of restraint coming into that picture. Um, basically, if you're an incumbent and you shoot it down, you know, and I'm a voter and I want my free check, you know, that's not a popular stance to take. And, and it, it's why we have the central bank as an independent force, generally speaking, in charge of this. If you put it in charge of politicians with frequent elections, um, you know, in charge of, of, of printing and handing out free money. You know, that's not a tremendous situation when you look at historical precedents, and it's an inflationary one unquestionably. So if we have a better than expected outcome in the virus narrative and we don't take central bank stimulus back and we're putting out virtually unlimited fiscal stimulus and probably in the hands of politicians who see it as something that's going to make them uh, less likely to be reelected if they fight against it, that's kind of, to me, a recipe for too much – Money chasing too few goods pretty quickly. So I'm sympathetic to that argument. Yeah, no, and, and I, I agree, and I know that it was something you put forward with the uh, modern monetary theory um, back in the trader strategy meeting, and um, I would completely agree. I think you got a better shot at finding Bigfoot than a fiscally responsible uh, politician on Capitol Hill right now. Uh, and, you know, that's just the way it goes. But I, I was really interested to see the parallel between the late 60s and what we're currently seeing right now with the social and civil unrest sure. um, that led to the end of Bretton Woods. So you could kind of get into a position where you would really just be printing away. Yeah. So well, now we don't have a Bretton Woods to end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. We, 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 we just have the um, printing presses. Well, it's not even the computer programs to run now. And I uh, get that really going. But all right, Brett, we're running on uh, a little bit over an hour here. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I mean, for me, 
uh, the big takeaways I thought were uh, there remains a lot of confusion in this market, which points towards some choppier trade over the next couple of weeks until we perhaps get a little bit more of a definitive leaning in one way or the other in terms of the argument on whether we're coming out of this uh, recession or if we're going to see prolonged economic weakness. Uh, I do like the broader scope and the, um, the stronger money that's coming into the markets, but there is a lot of loose, faster money uh, that's leveraged up, which I think could lead to some aggressive dips, but I do like the idea of support levels holding in and for people looking to buy the dip, finding out what levels that is remains the key. And then of course, the inflation story, which I just think you have to have gold in your portfolio at this point. Um, Brett, you want to wrap up everything for us here since you always do such an eloquent job at that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the picture to me, as far as strategic considerations as a market participant, um, the, the main takeaway to me is that there's a lot of opportunity if you're selective and you're willing to think on a shorter time frame. Uh, intraday trades, two or three day trades, tremendous amount of volatility, a lot of, a lot of money in a lot of, let's say, marks at the table. It's a poker game, and there's a lot of marks at the table right now. There's a lot of people who don't have a lot of experience, and they're using leveraged derivative instruments, and that's going to slosh things back and forth. Right now, we're seeing a two- or three-day range where that's not as much the case, and it's a good two or three days to do very little, but that's going to break out. That's going to break free. You're going to have good two-way action. There's going to be a lot of trading, I think a lot of trading opportunities over the next several months, probably from now through the summer into the election. Um, but it's really difficult to then try to say, I understand that this is the time for me to make – to dig my heels in on a long-term view of how this is all going to work out because the factors that are going to determine that are things you can't possibly know, and neither can anyone else, not the Fed, not the government, not the big money managers, not the small traders. Nobody knows where this is going. Nobody knows the information that's going to determine – the most important turns in the longer term narrative. I'm willing to bet on humanity finding the solutions it needs, and it's a bottom up bet. And I think that right now we've got resources we've never had before in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of big data, in terms of the ability to collaborate in real time around the world. And I think that's all happening. And I think very little of that makes it constantly into the headlines. So I, I think probably the virus situation is going to work out better than maybe we expect. But I don't know that. Um, I, I, I would bet on some level of a shift from a structural deflationary idea to a structural inflationary idea. And somewhere right about now is somewhere when the inflection is happening. But you can't put a pin in it and know exactly when. And it's still a multi-year gradual transition. That also feeds into demographic issues. We've got gradual transition toward the, the demographic dividend where there's more and more people who are in that 25 to 50 year old labor force statistic as you know, Gen, Gen Zers and millennials start to come into their sort of prime productive years. So that's a really inflationary force too. It's like the baby boomers when we got into the 70s and 80s. Um, so there's a lot of long-term structural shifts that are happening and there's a short-term drama that's around a completely unknowable thing. And in the middle of all that, there's a lot of new market participants, and there's a lot of marks at the table. So I think shifting to a shorter-term mindset and not trying to figure out where the long-term picture is going as your primary starting point is probably a good idea. There's a lot of easy trades if you're willing to be patient and just kind of let the easy trades come to you. The VIX is rarely sitting you know, at 25 to 40 for an extended period of time. That's the time to be thinking about – day trading and one to two day trades and not really thinking about big picture portfolio management as much. All right. Well, Brett, as per usual, thank you very much for getting on and joining us here today. Uh, we will be posting this recording and shortly. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, always feel free to write in. And Brett, uh, we will continue to discuss all these things in the markets as they unfold. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Kev. All right. Talk to you soon. Take care.